everyone. Welcome, or you should be welcoming us to this beautiful location here in Newport. Beach. I'm Susan Barrett. I'm the executive director of the Green Map Care Board. I'm joined tonight with board members. I'll just call out their names. We have Chair Owen Foster. We have board member Jessica Holmes. And I don't see her. <coughs> board member Robin Lunch. So joined with, by them and also some GMCD staff. In addition, we're joined by our colleagues from the Agency of Human Services. We have Todd Davos, who is the Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Human Services, and Kristen McClure, who's the Health Data Officer at the Agency of Human Services. We're so pleased to see such a large group turn out for us this evening. Thank you so much. We're very much looking forward to listening to all of you. On behalf of the Green Mountain Care Board, I want to thank the North Country CEO, Tom Frank, and Communications Director, Wendy Franklin. Both of them were so helpful in helping us plan this evening. I also want to thank the Board of Trustees for the hospital, for North Country Hospital, for their participation and feedback this past year. We're looking forward to continuing that work with them. I also want to call out a couple of other people. Uh, first is Mike Fisher. I saw him. There he is. Um, Mike Fisher is from the officer of the office of the healthcare advocate. He leads that office. One of his goals, one of his job parts of the, the work they do is making sure that Vermonters can access affordable healthcare. And then I also wanted to call out some of the other leaders from other hospitals in the region. I saw folks come in some folks from the Hospital Association, so nice to see you all here. I also see many legislators, and I will not call you out because I will get it wrong, um, but I, I want to in particular acknowledge the Essex County delegation. I know they had a long drive over here, and I know Essex County is the most rural of our counties in Vermont. And we all know that they face some of the most difficult issues for all Vermonters. So we're, we're delighted to have them here and again to listen to them. Last, I um, want to go through some housekeeping items and then I'll turn it over to board member Jessica Holmes who will have a few remarks as well. First, refreshments, food in that back team. We have water, some fruit, and some vegetables. Uh, healthy choices for all of you. The bathroom is located in the back area, and I'm sure many of you folks know these locations already. Um, at exits, there are many exits, but please mark your closest exit. Importantly, and I, I don't think we're gonna have a hard time hearing, but some things, um, some folks might want some closed captioning. So if folks are interested in signing up for the closed captioning, you can do that by getting on the Green Mountain Care Board website, and there is a link there. But I have someone in the room who can help you. You can just see I'm Daniel from the Green Mountain Care Board. If anyone needs help getting onto the link for the closed captioning or does not have a device, we have some extra devices with us. The, the, I wanted everyone in the room to know that media is present tonight, so just for your information. And then I also wanted to thank NEK TV, who is also here, there they are, in the back. Um, mm -hmm. Wanna make sure that it, when you're sharing any of your comments that you speak up so that they can um, capture that. And thank you NEK, NEK TV. The program is scheduled to go till 7.30 tonight. 
but we have the room for the evening, so if we go over, we won't get kicked out. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to board member Jessica Holmes. Thank you, Susan. Everyone hear me okay? Great, okay. Well, thank you all. My name is Jessica Holmes, and I'm a member of the Green Mountain Care Board. We're thrilled to see such a huge turnout tonight. We now have a few more. Get close to the mic up. Okay, so you do need to hear me louder. Okay, great. Thank you for telling me. Uh, we know how important it is for this community, and in fact, every community, to have access to high quality, affordable health care, and we welcome your participation in today's community meeting. For the past 10 months, Dr. Bruce Hamry and his team have held over 100 stakeholder meetings and community listening sessions. They've reviewed numerous and always scintillating state reports visited every hospital in the state and analyzed data of all shapes and sizes to help us assess the ability of our healthcare system to meet the needs of Vermonters now and in the next few years. In a few minutes, Dr. Hamery will share his team's findings with all of us. You may not know Dr. Hamery, uh, but you probably are familiar with some of his work. Uh, during the COVID crisis, Basically, Dr. Hamery was responsible for modeling all of the COVID infectious you know, predictions around infection rates and all of that. Dr. Hamery is an infectious disease doctor with a lot of expertise in that area. He's also the former chief medical officer for Geisinger, which is one of the most well-respected healthcare systems in the country. And he's a health systems design expert who's been consulting hospitals and health systems all over the country for over a decade. We're very lucky to have had him working in the state of Vermont. Uh, almost a year. Before he shares his findings, I wanted to put his important work into context and talk to you a little bit more about what brought us to this point. The Green Mountain Care Board, the Agency of Human Services, and the legislature have been hearing from Vermonters all over the state, in this community and every other community, that healthcare has become unaffordable. Employers and families are facing skyrocketing insurance premiums. Patients are grappling with rising out-of-pocket costs for office visits, x-rays, procedures, and drugs. It's truly heartbreaking to hear that people are choosing between getting a prescription filled and paying for their groceries. We hear you, we have a healthcare affordability crisis. And despite paying more and more for healthcare, we also hear from many of you that you cannot access the care that you need when you need it. Many primary care practices are closed to new patients, and in some areas of the state, people are waiting months to see a needed specialist. Those seeking mental health treatment and nursing home care often face significant barriers in obtaining that care, some languishing in emergency rooms and inpatient beds awaiting placement in more appropriate care settings. So we also hear you, we are facing an access crisis. If not addressed, these very real access and affordability issues mean the difference between life and death, or the difference between a life well lived versus one spent in sickness, pain, and medical death. Our provider community has also shared their challenges with us. We hear from many, many Vermont uh, independent providers, the dedicated doctors, nurse practitioners, physical therapists, mental health counselors, and others who operate small practices independent of a hospital, but they cannot afford to practice in Vermont anymore. Recruiting and retaining staff has become a growing challenge, and their revenues are not keeping pace with their costs. And as our aging providers retire, there are very few willing to take over their struggling practices. Our local hospitals are not immune to these financial headwinds. In 2023, nine of our 14 hospitals had negative operating margins, meaning that their operating revenues did not cover the costs of delivering the care. This is especially troubling to the board, given that the GMCB, the board, the Green Mountain Care Board, allowed hospitals to increase their charges by an average of over 10% that year in an effort to keep hospitals afloat and preserve access to the care their community needs. But double-digit hospital charge increases at rates greater than wage growth are not sustainable. Vermonters can't afford it. Vermont is not alone. Rural hospitals around the country are losing money. How do they respond? Many shut down unprofitable but essential services like maternal and pediatric care and mental health. Some close their doors forever. Across the U.S., we have seen that market forces left to their own lead to the abrupt loss of healthcare sister services in our most vulnerable rural communities. Green Mountain Care Board does not want that to happen to any community in Vermont. But as Vermonters' working age population shrinks, and its population ages, reimbursements are not covering the cost of delivering care in those communities. 
Increasing reimbursements is not likely to be the answer. Taxpayers, employers, and families cannot afford to pay hospital prices and insurance premiums that grow faster than their wages. We need to look at the underlying cost structure of our healthcare system and seek out more affordable ways to deliver much needed care. This is where Dr. Hamry's expertise can help us find a path forward. The analysis you will hear today is unique. No other state is taking such a comprehensive, data-driven, community-inclusive, proactive approach to assessing the current and projected state of its healthcare delivery system. No other state is looking at the demographic and expense growth trends and trying to envision a delivery system that can both meet community needs and withstand the financial headwinds coming our way. No other state is really seeking such comprehensive, innovative solutions. One thing I wanted to note about today is that it's a critical just first step in a much longer process. We hope today is the start of many solution-seeking conversations between communities, healthcare leaders, hospitals, community providers, legislators, and state agencies. While Dr. Hamry will help us assess the preparedness of our current system, we look forward to continued dialogue with all of you to brainstorm ways to stem the affordability crisis and preserve access to essential services in every community. The legislature has directed the Agency of Human Services to lead the next stage of this transformation process by working with hospital leaders and communities to find a more sustainable path. So at this point, I'm going to pass it along to Todd Davis from the Agency of Human Services for some additional welcome papers. Thanks, Jessica. I, I'm Todd Davis, as, as Jessica said. I uh, have the privilege of serving as the Deputy Secretary of HS. And just for a little more context, I also grew up in Glover. Um, have some significant connections to the community. I spent most of my life in, uh, in San Diego. I can't say that anymore. I'm trying. It's not going to get quite high enough. So if I lean in like this, is that better? I'll get up here, people will get this. Great. So I, I mostly want to set with context, you know, a deep understanding from the agency's perspective about the challenges that, uh, as, as Jessica once said and, and Susan before her, what the rural Vermonters face in terms of access to health care and the long term challenges that we face as a state in ensuring affordability uh, and equitable access. And that's really what we want to listen to today and talk about today. Um, the heart of our mission really is ensuring access to timely, affordable, high quality health care for every member of the community. That's going to be different in different communities, but it's extremely important. The work that Oliver Wyman does and Dr. Bruce has done and will present is a key element. But from our perspective in the agency, an equally key element is hearing from the community about what the community needs are and the community challenges are. And this is a great opportunity, the first opportunity, to really hear that from community members. I do want to contextualize a little bit more, and I don't want to repeat too much. It's going to get hotter in here, and we really need to hear the main event here. But, you know, the healthcare landscape faces a lot of challenges. It, evol it is evolving extremely rapidly. As we all know in Vermont, especially in the kingdom, um, it is influenced significantly by a major demographic shift from a working age population to an older Vermont population. Um, there are tremendous economic pressures, and, and we still feel the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. These changes both present opportunities and obstacles that require us to think creatively and collaboratively about how we deliver health care. One of our primary goals is to address the immediate financial challenges that the healthcare system is, is experiencing. And I want to be clear there, you know, I, I see Kelsey in the back and, and think about uh, Northeast Kingdom Human Services and, and the real crucial role that our designated agencies play, along with Tom Frank and the hospital. We really want to think about healthcare and healthcare support expansively. Rising healthcare costs across the board have placed a huge strain on hospitals and providers, and most importantly, patients. We are committed to finding solutions that will alleviate these financial burdens while maintaining the highest standards of care and ensuring, and certainly this is mainly focused on hospitals, that we maintain these vibrant economic drivers in our communities. Hospitals do more than provide care. However, our vision must extend beyond the present moment. 
We are dedicated to building a more resilient and responsive healthcare system that can adapt to future challenges. This means investing in preventative care, getting upstream, and improving access to long-term care services, getting downstream. It means fostering a healthcare environment that is inclusive and equitable, and ensuring that all individuals, regardless of their background, circumstances, and abilities to pay, can receive the care they need. This isn't new to many of you, I know that. In fact, we're working alongside many of you on initiatives such as the Blueprint for Health expansion pilot, community-based mobile crisis, and mental health urgent care programs. We're working to establish certified community-based integrated health centers, or CCBHCs, where community-based mental health and substance use disorder treatment providers offer a wider range of services. We recognize the extreme challenges that substance use disorders place in our communities, especially where it is co-occurring with mental health needs. We also recognize the need for outpatient mental health and substance use disorder treatment, along with primary care, what I just call the doctor's office, primary care screening and monitoring, and peer support services. At the same time, we're making strides to expand who can receive substance use disorder services and opening a new skilled nursing facility, unfortunately quite far from Newport, um, that specializes in complex care so that folks who need more than a normal or standard skilled nursing facility level of care can get it. These are just a few examples of the progress being made in our communities and which are being supported by over $212 million in increased annual payments to providers that were made over the last three years. That's trying to right-size the payments to keep providers able, economically, financially, sustainably, providing care for our communities. So as I said, today we all look forward to hearing your perspectives. The input from this group, this community, is vital as we navigate these complex issues. We need your feedback to understand the needs and concerns of the Newport, North Country, Orleans County, Essex County, probably parts of, of Franklin as well, county community. These recommendations will inform our future work together through a learning health system where we use data and evidence to drive improved care. Together we, will, we can make informed, impactful changes that will benefit everyone. So as I said at the top, in closing I want to emphasize that this is not just a dialogue for today, this is not the only opportunity, but we want to begin an ongoing conversation around what reform is going to look like, what transformation and sustainability in healthcare is going to look like for each community. We have to work together as a community and as a state to address the challenges head on. I'm confident that with your support and collaboration, we can create a healthcare system that is sustainable, efficient, and continues to truly serve the needs of all Vermonters. So again, thank you for being here. Thanks for taking the time. I think we all really look forward to Bruce um, and a productive conversation after that. But beforehand, I wanna just have um, Tom Frank come up here, CEO of North Country Hospital. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, I look out here, I see a lot of friends, a lot of supporters, and a lot of patients, and the patients do need to be heard. We at the hospital recognize the cost of health care is not sustainable. We know that we have to change and work and do things differently in order to provide the care that everyone in this community needs. As a fellow Gloverite, uh, I do understand the folks that are this community needs this. You know, we are a primary care based hospital. We just recruited three new primary care physicians to come to the community. Um, we have to make difficult decisions in order for us to maintain uh, what we are able to provide in this community, but we will continue to fight for what's right. We will look to reduce costs where possible and make sure we provide the appropriate services. I don't want to take too much time tonight because we do want to hear from Dr. Hammond, but I, I just want to introduce Bruce. He and I have had the pleasure of working together. I think the first time he came was January. Came over uh, Sheffield Heights, okay? Uh, ice, 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 baby. But uh, Dr. Henry is incredibly knowledgeable. It's been a pleasure working with him. We've had some great conversations, we've had some debates, um, but we've really come to consensus on what this community needs. So I would like to introduce Dr. Henry. Uh, so from here, Bruce, it's all you. Good evening, and thank you very much for coming. This, as has been said, is a very important uh, start of a series of conversations. I hope you will forgive me for sitting down. I have a bit of a knee and hip problem, and standing up for a long time is a, 
a little bit of a problem. So I think I can see you all uh, if I'm sitting. I will try to keep my remarks fairly short. They're still going to go 35 minutes probably because we have a, a lot to talk about. Uh, but again, thank you very much. It's been very valuable for me because I've been meeting a lot of folks I've talked to and been working with for a long time. Uh, really for the first time, we've done a lot of it uh, virtually. So, as has been said, we're here tonight to report back to you the Newport, Orange, and Essex County community uh, on our efforts to fulfill the mandates of Act 167. These are, as has been said, to conduct a data-driven, patient-focused, community-inclusive effort to assist Vermont's hospitals uh, to reduce inefficiencies, lower costs, I would say constrained cost growth. Costs are probably not going down. Uh, improve population outcomes, reduce health inequities, and increase access to essential services. That would be uh, increase. People are here tonight representing not only North Country Hospital and its board, uh, you've heard from the Green Mountain Care Board and the Vermont Agency of Human Services. Our Oliver Wyman team is here to present and to answer your questions, along with the other people not in groups present. As has been said, my name is Bruce Hamery. I am a physician with over 50 years of experience in practicing and teaching medicine, hospital and health system administration, and healthcare consulting. My colleague in this effort is Ms. Elizabeth Sutherland, a partner in the firm of West Monroe, and an expert in health inequity. And she's been leading that part, an important part of this effort. Uh, unfortunately, she wasn't able to join us this evening. We are ably assisted by Ms. Irene Way, our engagement manager, and by Ms. Danielle Etzel, our senior consultant. Our journey began 11 months ago, in August of 2023. Uh, as uh, Dr. Holmes noted, we have spoken with and listened to over 1,800 Vermonters from all 14 hospital service areas. In this journey, we have been greatly assisted by the staff of the Green Mountain Care Board, uh, Ms. Marisa Melamed, Ms. Hillary Watson, uh, Ms. Susan Barrett, from whom you've heard, and many others. We've also been helped by many leaders and staff throughout the agency of human services, and by Mr. Mike Fisher and his staff at the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. I would note that Mr. Mike Del Treco and his staff at the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems have been especially helpful. So you can see we've talked to a lot of folks. Another consulting firm, Mathematica, and, and a team there led by Dr. Arpadipta Ghosh has performed many of the data analyses we've used to develop the options for changes in care delivery. Those options were presented to each hospital and its board, and the options were then amended based on our conversations with each hospital, board, and often medical staff. to accomplish four things. First, to report what you and your fellow Vermonters around the state have told us about your lived experiences with healthcare. Second, 
to explain the problems facing North Country Hospital, your community, and the state as a whole. Most of these are beyond the control of the hospital. We will also show you what some of the impacts might be on your communities and on the Vermont health system. Third, we want to share at a high level, and I say high, this will be statewide, not particular necessarily to Newport and the counties and to North Country. Uh, and uh, what some options are that could be used to address current and future projected needs. Uh, these will apply to many hospital and, and the communities, but not all. Most importantly, as several have said before, uh, we want to set the stage for your active participation as a citizen and as a community in a process to transform healthcare in Vermont. As was said, this process will be led by the Agency of Human Services, supported by the Green Mountain Care Board. This is the next step in fulfilling the, man, the legislative mandate of Act 167. This is the agenda for our meeting. I will try to keep my comments short so we have maximum time for your questions and comments. This presentation is being posted to the website of the Green Mountain Care Board and will also be available to you there to make any additional comments and suggestions uh, that you care to make. We do monitor that. We did this previously and incorporated those comments and experiences uh, into what, uh, what we're going to talk about. So these are some of the quotes that you, uh, the physicians and other caregivers in the community, told us last fall. I call your attention to the quote on mental health. Due to my insurance, I have very limited access to mental health services. Access to care. It's hard to find a doctor. It's a 50-minute drive to find my doctor. It's not hard getting an appointment, but I need to drive to New Hampshire for three hours to get treatment. A common problem around the state. These, we had similar comments uh, from across the state. Uh, I've listed a few here. I'm not going to read all these, but I will say that they certainly involved housing, affordability, cost of care, access to mental health care, access to gender affirming care, and very importantly, transportation. So let's set the, the background for your current experiences. As I said, all Vermont communities are experiencing significant challenges to healthcare access, equity, and affordability. The access and equity challenges are shown in, uh, on the left. The affordability challenges on the right. Note the difficulties, as, pre as others have said, in getting timely appointments for doctors and for surgery. We've had people tell us it's 18 months to get scheduled for a, a, an operation. Transportation is an issue. When you get the appointment and can afford it, getting there and getting back can be a real issue. On the affordability front, as others have said, there have been major increases in both health insurance premiums and out-of-pocket uh, expenses, making the use of health care out of financial reach, even for many who have insurance. Increases in the cost of a silver plan on the state health insurance exchange recently have made it the most expensive in New England. It is twice the cost of the one in Massachusetts and one of the most expensive in the U.S. Major changes are needed to reduce these increases. So, 
Vermont hospitals and most others in the U.S. face significant operational and financial challenges. These include the ability to recruit or the inability to recruit staff, whether that is due to national shortages of physicians, of nurses, and other professionals, or to a lack of affordable housing in Vermont when these people can be identified. And several hospitals have told me, you know, I've, I've recruited the doctor, I've got the nurse, they've come to work, they live for three months in a hotel, and they left. So it's a problem not only for Vermonters, but also for people that want to come to Vermont. A major issue affecting small communities like Newport is that the number, the number of doctors in a specialty that must be recruited to provide an acceptable call schedule. The community must also have enough patients to support that many doctors. Forty years ago, I can say, an acceptable call schedule was one night in two and before that, my grandfather was in practice and on call every night. Okay. Those days are gone. Uh, now, an acceptable call schedule is one night in every four or five. So, instead of being able to recruit one cardiologist or one surgeon or one um, family practitioner, uh, you often have to recruit four or five, and that means you need a big enough community to have enough patients to need four or five. We'll talk about how, um, how the hospitals in Vermont are dealing with this. This presents recruiting difficulties across the U.S., not only for small hospitals, but I can tell you that UVM and Dartmouth uh, and other universities face similar problems, even in larger communities. Many hospitals are old and need to replace air conditioning, heating units, elevators, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So they have not been able to make the needed money uh, from their patient revenues. Some surgeries done at hospitals may be done too infrequently for the staff to maintain an adequate proficiency. Many of these surgeries require not only expertise on the part of the surgeon, but also from the anesthesiologist, the operating room staff, and sometimes from the presence of an ICU or uh, other specialists. Um, infectious disease people used to spend a lot of time uh, with some patients. Supporting these teams with the staff and the equipment necessary will likely require hospitals to combine some surgical and medical specialists in ways that support regional access without requiring people to travel to UVM or Dartmouth or Boston or New York or Albany. Many hospital resources are also consumed by people who do not need the services of an acute care hospital. These individuals may be waiting for transfer to a mental health or chronic care facility. They may need a place to live or the services of a home health agency so they can be discharged from the hospital or the emergency room. The hospital is not paid for these folks because their care is, quote, no longer medically necessary. They also occupy beds and nursing time that could be used for other patients who do require admission to an acute care setting. On the financial side, the costs of the people who work in hospitals and the drugs and supplies needed to care for patients, as Dr. Holmes said, are increasing at rates higher than the hospital is paid. Recent changes in federal law and regulation will further increase the demand for and cost of nurses and physicians, as well as the cost of medical supplies and devices produced in China. I commented uh, on these in some detail in my presentation to the Green Mountain Care Board yesterday, and that's on the uh, website. Insurers are also making it more difficult for providers and hospitals 
by requiring pre-certification for testing, pre-authorization for procedures, and sometimes by denying payment altogether. You've seen this slide, I expect. Uh, in fiscal year 2023, nine of the 14 hospitals in Vermont had negative operating margins. Uh, as Dr. Holmes explained, an operating margin is like the balance in your checkbook. It reflects the income a hospital gets from patient services minus the expense of providing those services. If you include the two additional hospitals in Vermont that were in the red in fiscal year 2022, 11 of the 14 hospitals in the state have had negative operating margins recently. And you see on the slide um, a number over the years uh, prior. This makes money, borrowing money expensive and difficult for the hospital and makes the financial stability of the sustainability of the hospital problematic. I must note that all hospital directors and staff and all boards are taking whatever measures they can to address these issues. Not-for-profit Vermont health plans are also not making money. They are tightly regulated and their premium increases are driven by the cost of care paid to providers, <laughs> hospitals, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, and others on your behalf as pays for your care. They are also required to maintain certain levels of reserves to ensure that they have the ability to care for, to pay for the care you require and these reserves are reaching levels that are alarmingly low. Every commercially insured Vermonter's cost of health care has increased markedly over the past six years. While inflation increased in the U.S. by 3.6% between 2018 and 2022, shown on the left, or sorry, shown in the middle. The, um, the median increase in household income for Vermonters was 1%. These costs have increased even more for the employers that provide health insurance for their employees. In the middle panel, the Green Mountain Care Board has approved hospital requested increases in charges of 38%, and the cost of the silver plan shown on the extreme right, uh, the benchmark for comparison across state uh, health plans, that increased 108%. Steps must be taken, plans must be made, and implemented to change these rates of increase. And that's where you come in, in this process that will go forward. So, how have we uh, approached these issues? Well, uh, we took the approach any doctor would take for a sick patient. We used interviews and data to make a diagnosis. We used tools and data to make a prognosis, a forecast of what the future might look like, given certain assumptions. And we developed and identified various potential treatments some were drastic. All may require substantial changes. You, as the patient, get to decide on the treatment, together with your hospital board, leadership, other communities and hospitals, the Agency of Human Services, the Green Mountain Care Board, and others. And I emphasize, you're receiving the care. You're the patient. If we're having a conversation and I'm telling you you have a bad disease, here's where you get to help select how it gets fixed. And there are a lot of options that are being used around the country that I think uh, various parts of Vermont could use and, and do pretty well. Okay. So we listened to you. We took a history of your past and present illnesses, reviewed your symptoms and so forth. The many people and groups we have interviewed here uh, are shown here. 
These included not only hospital leaders and boards, but also the many healthcare professionals who serve your communities. These have included dentists, physical therapists, mental health counselors, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, emergency medicine technicians, home health agencies, nursing home administrators, and many others. We have spoken with many state agencies, twice, uh, and departments, as well as some of the legislation. We have also met with a number of community and state organizations and individuals advocating for those suffering from health inequity and those with special needs, whether those are mental health needs, physical needs, and those with specific illnesses needing more specialized care. We have specifically sought out groups with unique language, ethnic, and gender identity characteristics, among others. We perform tests on your community. Mathematica did projections of the total population in Orleans County. We did not do, we did a separate one for Essex, but as you may know, that care is split between North Country uh, and St. Johnsburg. These show a decline in population of about 7% through 2040. This is generally true in Vermont, by the way, the only county that's not projected to have a declining population is Chittenden County. But it is also true in many areas around the United States. This is accompanied by an increase in the proportions and numbers of elderly citizens, those 65 to 70 years old, shown in the light blue part of the bars. That goes up to 22%, and the advanced elderly goes 75 years and up uh, in the dark blue to 13.3%. So that total is 35% of the folks that count. It's a huge number. The net impact is that people over 65 will increase markedly. This represents an increase in this county of about 3,000 elderly people and will reach a total of about 9,000 by 2040. As noted in the lower right, these people will have markedly different social and medical needs. And as a person who's 77, I can assure you that's true. These needs will include more assisted living, memory care, and other facilities, as well as accessible housing. Note the light gray areas, which represent the working age population, those between 20 and 64. These are the people who have commercial insurance and therefore pay the dollars needed above Medicare and Medicaid to support care in the community. This population will decrease by 19%, meaning that fewer dollars will be available and that even higher insurance premiums might be needed to support Vermont's health care system in its current form and with its current financial underpinning. We also used county level rates to project modest increases in your needs for cancer care and in hospitalizations for heart attacks and strokes. We share this information in detail uh, with, um, with the board of the hospital and its leadership. We did a physical exam to look at your systems of care. The least expensive places to receive care and to prevent the need for more advanced and expensive types of care are shown at the top. Houses, group homes, adequate numbers of facilities uh, for uh, mental health treatment, substance use disorders, and so forth. Uh, are needed and it's noted are being made available but even more aren't still needed. Enhanced capabilities and staff for primary caregivers, mental health, and substance use disorders are needed. We uh, showed the board some uh, information on this. As depicted, 
When these things are not readily available, when they're squeezed, people seek care in the emergency department, sometimes with an advanced form of illness needing hospitalization. And the emergency room folks say they're seeing folks come in second. If the illness is too far advanced, or, or the community hospital is full, they may require transfer to a larger <coughs> medical center. The result is an inconvenience for the patient and her family, together with a bigger bill for the care. Using all this information, analysis, and reports from prior state commissions and consultant reports, we then constructed a financial prognosis or forecast. This makes certain assumptions which we have tested with many people, and I will note not everyone agrees with the exact numbers. However, I would comment nobody is, a, dis, is really disagreeing with the general trend. Shown on the left are the increases in charges requested by North Country Hospital and the rates approved by the Green Mountain Care Board. Over the five-year period, the average of approved rate increases <clears throat> was the same as the requested amount, about 3.6%. Larger increases were requested in fiscal year 2023 and 2024, slightly less was approved. The curve on the right shows the past performance of North Country Hospital for the period 2018 to 2022 on the left. The gray column represents the base year of 2023 after COVID, after a lot of money flowed in and out uh, for various reasons with the feds. Um, we use 2023. The assumptions we use for our projections are important to note. They were a cap on rises in hospital prices of 3.5%. This is the current cap for revenue increases set by the Green Mountain Care Board in its efforts to slow the rise in healthcare costs. Estimates of the ongoing increases in hospital expenses nationally range from 5 to almost 8%. Some hospital executives in Vermont told us they planned to control their costs to 5%. So that is the assumption we show here. We also did projections using a 7 to 8% increase in expenses. And as you would imagine, that's worse. All of these were shared and discussed in a meeting with North Country Hospital, its leadership, and its board. All hospitals in Vermont show these same trends toward losses. I showed that data yesterday to the Green Mountain Care Board. Every hospital uses the following levers to improve their operating margins and financial health. They increase rates and therefore payments from insurers and patients. They cut expenses, which in many cases, small rural hospitals like North Country do not have the capability to do because they are already tightly staffed and staff is one of the major drivers of expense. It counts 60 to 65% of total costs in a, in a Hampton hospital. They can increase the volume of profitable services and sometimes cut unprofitable ones. They seek support from the state or from grants or donations. Pulling these levers for most Vermont hospitals has not been successful in achieving sustainable operating margins. We therefore made a large effort to see if addressing the problems of quote, potentially preventable emergency department visits, that is, things that people go to the emergency room for that a primary care doctor or a mental health professional in the community to could take care of if, if you could get in to see them. 
We also looked at the, the issue of potentially preventable hospitalizations uh, and readmissions and the effect of reducing the number of borders, which might free up enough capacity for North Country Hospital and others to bring back the people who are leaving your community to seek services at other hospitals, but that North Country and its staff have the capability to do. A major design principle for us was to return as much care as possible to your hospital as it has the capacity for with current staffing and has the, its staff has the capability and expertise to do. A second design principle was to enable new types of care to move patients out of UVM and Dartmouth. We did double check the capacities and capabilities with Mr. Frank. Sadly, when we went through all this uh, for most hospitals, uh, these measures improved revenue but also increased some expenses and resulted in no significant improvement in these projections. So the financial stability of many of the hospitals in Vermont is going to require additional money. That's one way of doing it. There are others. Uh, these dollars will likely not come from the federal government through Medicare, which has historically controlled its expenses to two and a half, maybe three percent a year, uh, or Medicaid. It cannot come from a continued major rise in commercial insurance premiums, and so most likely must come either from increased taxes at a state or local level or from donations. There are also more headwinds coming. Recent changes in federal policy and regulation will produce more demand for nurses to staff nursing homes and therefore increase wages. A recent tariff announced on uh, medical supplies made in China uh, will increase the cost of medical supplies uh, and devices. A cut in payments to home health agencies was announced last week. That's uh, not helpful to anybody. And there are others. I, I noted in my comments that there has been significant uh, uh, movement or desire to move on the part of Medicaid to reduce the payments hospitals get for providing services in their uh, ambulatory clinics. Uh, and those would be reduced to the level that a private uh, physician gets or a freestanding uh, operating uh, ambulatory surgery. And that would be a, a real disaster. But given federal budget constraints, um, I you know, have to say it, it's uh, likely to happen at some time. So where do we go from here? Oops. Hospitals cannot solve their, these problems alone. Different and more innovative pro approaches will be needed to reduce costs and to continue to improve health services in the community. Solving Vermont's challenge will require concerted, sustained transformation of the healthcare system with the Green Mountain Care, Board, Mountain Care Board and Agency of Human Services Assistance and your active involvement. What can health care in Vermont look like? What is required for this? What things are already underway? And you've heard a number of from the uh, Agency of Human Services. They're really quite active. A lot of very good things going on, but too many for me to list and, and comment appropriately on. So what does this uh, charting path forward look like? First, recognize the current situation and the adverse headwinds you are facing. The Marines would term this adapt. 
We have discussed these uh, issues earlier. Secondly, change what you can and build on current efforts to change the way healthcare is delivered in your community. The Marines would call this survive. Next, design and implement ways to improve access, equity, and to reduce the cost of healthcare in your community. The Marines use the term overcome for this. Done in the right way, these changes can ensure that the redesigned services have a stable financial and operational future at North Country Hospital and in Orange and Essex counties. Abraham Lincoln said the most reliable way to predict the future is to create it. The system you will help design with the folks at North Country Hospital, the other communities in your area, other communities in Vermont, and other hospitals in Vermont, will need to address both your current needs and those of your community in the near future. Shown here is information from the most recent community health needs assessment done in your community uh, with North Country Hospital. Note on the right, the list of identified needs to be and being addressed is very similar to what you told us and other communities have told us. These needs include housing, employment, regular medical care, and access to mental health services. Others are the need to change or treat certain behaviors and to provide better access to urgent medical care needs and acute mental health services. And as was noted, the uh, Agency of Human Services is working with a number of you to do that. There are many current efforts underway in your community. A few are shown here. There are active efforts to assist current hospital staff in obtaining the education needed to advance their careers in healthcare as nurses and in other roles. The hospital is partnering with other local organizations to expand mental health and other services in the community. And uh, congratulations to Mr. Frank and the board. As he noted, you've uh, been able to recruit three additional primary care folks uh, to come uh, and work. Changes at both a hospital and state health system level are required to meet both current and future needs for health care. These needs fall broadly into the five areas shown. Embed updated and modern information technology in hospitals, offices, homes, and other places. Provide housing for Vermonters and others moving into the state. Adequate housing, whether a single dwelling, mixed income housing, group housing for those with mental health or other needs, or assisted living facilities is required to reduce the crowding in hospitals and mental health facilities because patients have nowhere else to go. Transportation for people to and from medical care, Pharmacies and other places need to be enhanced and available in the late afternoons, evenings, and on weekends to help people with urgent care needs get to and from the urgent care doctor's office or emergency department. Emergency medical services, which are largely staffed by volunteers, need to be combined <clears throat> tightly to the hospitals and made into a full-time professional workforce. This would create additional jobs in the community and allow the provision of patient transport to and between facilities using uh, vehicles other than a mobile ICU. In the planning process to be described shortly, hospitals and communities will need to design a system in which there are also regional referral centers, each containing a sufficient population and area with sufficient population, multiple counties likely, 
to support the physicians, staff, equipment, um, and other services needed to provide high quality, efficient care for specific diseases or conditions. Work we have done and shared with each hospital suggests there is and will be sufficient need that some of these centers could be supported without people having to travel to UVM, Dartmouth, Albany, or Boston. In the system to be developed, all providers, primary care people, specialists, dentists, EMT services, hospitals, social work, social providers, and others should have their payments linked to common goals, access, quality, efficiency, appropriate use of resources, and equity. Let me be clear about efficiency. This means doing the right thing at the right time, not forgetting to give a vaccine or ordering a more expensive test when another may be adequate and less expensive. As noted below, the goal is to provide the most appropriate and needed care in your home, in the community, or close by. So the, these are some of the options available. They are, um, there are many, and they are options for, for North Country Hospital, your community, to work with other communities and hospitals to develop new programs and to expand existing ones. And I know that um, Mr. Frank and Mr. Tester are working together um, as are other hospital people around the state to get some of these things done. Telehealth is used by many hospitals in Vermont to support their emergency room staff. Uh, these need to be increased and paid for. They are expensive. Rural outreach programs. Hospitals could combine resources to equip and staff mobile vans to take care of two rural communities. Examples exist in Vermont of mobile dental treatment and in other places that I've helped set up mammography units, primary care clinics, mobile screening for osteoporosis, and others. Uh, folks could expand hours into the late evenings and on weekends to allow working people and children to have access to care after work and in the evening. Some clinics have tried to do this, but staffing the ability to get the nurses and others um, to work um, needs attention. All are possible, many are underway, or in some stage of development. Each option addresses one or more of the issues raised. As your capabilities improve for the transmission of medical information and you expand broadband internet to more communities, the ability to deliver more services and to further uh, to people's homes, to primary care offices, and to further interconnect hospitals become easier. Hospitals do use telehealth to provide support to the emergency room for stroke patients, the diagnosis and treatment of mental health conditions, heart problems, and others. These allow the patient to be kept in the local community rather than being sent elsewhere. Expanding this capability to allow people to be seen in their homes or treated in their home with monitoring for changes in the course of their illness would enable high quality care to be delivered in a more comfortable and lower cost setting. These things are done. You may be aware Amazon has just offered us a diagnostic service at 49 bucks a crack last week. And for people who lack a car or other transportation, um, that's needed. Taking care to them can address problems of both access and equity. Taking care of the migrant farm workers where they are employed would also make it possible for them to get care without raising wages. Another critical need is for programs to specifically address the needs of the small numbers of people 
who have multiple medical and physical needs. These populations comprise only 10 to 20 percent of the total population, but account for 30 to 40 percent of all the dollars spent on health care. There are programs available to provide needed medical services and care that re significantly reduce the cost of emergency care hospitalization. As I, none of these programs are available in Vermont, as far as I am aware. On the right side of the slide are listed the major steps in the designing the future. The Agency of Human Services, with the support of the Green Mountain Care Board, will lead this process to gather communities, providers, hospitals, and others who desire to plan their future to assist you and others in choosing among the options for care mechanisms and to help evaluate the effect of those both on the health of you and your community and for their financial sustainability. So there are many initiatives going on. I will not review these. I call only to your attention um, the uh, Effort, large efforts directed to mental health and substance use support and to elderly care support. Many other efforts are underway, and I commented on these in detail about three weeks ago when I gave a presentation to the Green Mountain Care Board. The Green Mountain Care Board has also had many efforts over the years to try to constrain the increases in both medical costs and insurance premiums. These are shown here. This project on Act 167 is the product of several years of effort with the legislature to obtain funding and to shape the objectives we have been trying to help achieve. They also commissioned and had a report done on the state of rural health care several years ago. As I noted at the start, they've worked with the Agency of Human Services and the legislature to obtain funding for this effort. The legislature has also been trying to address some of these issues. They have approved increases in Medicaid funding and recently enacted a law to eliminate requirements for pre-authorization. So where do each of you go next? How can you get involved in the process going forward? You can attend community meetings, and planning sessions. You can look at the websites of the Green Mountain Care Board and the Agency of Human Services for updates and opportunities to comment. You can support Mr. Frank and his team and the, and the hospital board in making what may be difficult or painful changes. Change will not happen by itself. Designing and implementing an improved sustainable delivery system <coughs> will require the active participation of everyone in this room, of other communities and hospitals, and is the state of Vermont. As shown by this photo of an Amish community raising a barn in Lancaster County, working together, much can be accomplished. You have many more tools available to you than the farmers in this picture. Broad changes in custom and practice will also be required across the state. What affects one community affects many others. An unplanned, unanticipated disaster in one community, whether a flood, a pandemic, or a hospital closing, has impacts throughout Vermont. As I discussed a short time ago, the financial projections for many hospitals in the state, and potentially here, I say potentially, show diminishing financial stability over the next three to five years. Therefore, your time horizon or runway to design and begin to implement the needed changes is short. The airplane runway on the left is two miles long. The one on the right is on the top of a mountain in Bhutan and is 300 yards long, with a cliff at one end and an airplane hangar at the other. Your runway is probably closer to the one on the right than the one on the left. 
Our team's work in this presentation are only the first steps in the complicated process for improving healthcare delivery in Vermont so that they are sustainable, affordable for all, and improve equity, access, and the health of citizens. I hope I have convinced you of the urgency and the need to have your participation in addressing these problems, the need to be proactive and to support the process and the changes needed to achieve the goals that you have outlined in prior community meetings and your legislature has outlined. I'll now ask Mr. Frank to make comments. Thanks. I'll be brief, I promise. Yeah, we Thank you very much. So, although Bruce and I don't completely agree on the numbers, um, we definitely agree that if we don't make changes here in our community at North Country Hospital, those numbers will become a reality. Over the last two years, we suffered uh, immensely from a, a very uh, a very poor implementation of electronic medical record uh, that has absolutely destroyed our organization. So I believe it's more of a blemish the last two years than what reality is going forward. Although again, if we don't change, we are going to see those negative margins continue. We've made tremendous headway this year. We've brought in folks to help us turn some of this around. We currently are fighting with our EMR and have chosen a route to go through the court system in order to get some satisfaction. Um, the one thing, as I said, we agree on is if we don't change, we're in trouble and we are changing dramatically. Um, we've had to make some very difficult decisions this year. Uh, those decisions include not replacing the urologist that has left the community. We are working very closely with NVRH and Sean Tester to be able to find and be able to provide urological care in the Northeast Kingdom, maybe not necessarily at North Country. We have replaced a uh, cardiologist that left the community with a returning cardiologist because that, as you said, the Asian population is going to require cardiologic services. We have decided that we are no longer going to do hip and knee replacements at North Country Hospital. That was a huge decision. Orthopedic surgeons are the most expensive resource, resource you can have, I'll be honest. Base salary is $650,000 a year. You have to do a lot of hips and knees to be able to support that. We cannot do it. So we believe there's plenty of opportunity, again, through NERH. In other hospitals such as Coughlin, we provide that service, keep it in the mind. So we continue to look at ways to work to be able to, um, to reduce the loss. This budget that we're going to present to the Green Rock Care for next year includes a very moderate, modest fee increase ask. Um, we are 70% Medicare and Medicaid, so by getting a large commercial increase, it really doesn't do us a heck of a lot of good, to be absolutely honest. Um, our budget contains a 2.94% net, uh, net patient revenue increase, which is very small, and our expenses are flat year over year. That produces a 2% positive budget for FY25. This year, we are still at a loss, but far less than the 9% you saw last year and the 11% you saw the year before. So we are working very hard to turn things around but there will be changes that we have to make as a system in order for us to move. I don't want to take too much time, I just want to make sure we have those comments. Thank you. Thank you, and questions or comments, please. Oh, okay. We did have a, a sign up, and then we'll take whatever. Uh, Mr. Lennon. Yeah, I want to thank you all for coming and making this presentation. I know you've got a lot of work for us in this. Uh, we need a regional hospital. There's no question about it. Whether the ideal location and staff and so forth is a North Country Hospital, I don't know. Um, I wrote a letter to the uh, CEO, Mr. Frank, and, and uh, the chair of the board uh, a few months ago. 
stating, in fact, that, that my, one of my major concerns is the abysmal uh, mechanism for making appointments, for uh, sending out information. You know, you have a test, uh, or some doctor, Dr. Hitchcock, has to send facts, for goodness sakes, 19th century technology here, uh, which is often missed, but there's a fact, uh, in order to order a test. Uh, I spent today over an hour on telephone with various people trying to get uh, uh, an ultrasound schedule that a doctor uh, has a doctor from Thomas has ordered and made no problem. Made absolutely no problem. The Senate system is terrible. It's really awful. Uh, the Epic system to me looks a lot better, but I understand it's very expensive. Everything is expensive. This is something that the table can really help me. Mr. Frank I wrote a, a not bad in the Chronicle couple of months ago saying that the one thing that the state could do to improve medical care would be to support a decent uh, communication mechanism among hospitals, doctors, and patients. Uh, so that we know what the heck is going on with our health. Uh, I think the state could do something on this matter. We have how many? 13 hospitals? 15 hospitals? 14. 14 hospitals. I have 14 hospitals. They, could all, they should all be on the same system, and it should be regional. It should include New Hampshire hospitals, because I go to two different New Hampshire hospitals, which it doesn't have. For example, uh, Michael, which is a Vermont thing, doesn't work in the direction. Um, these things have to be done. There is something I think that the Campbell could really have a lot of influence. The state could buy a system for all the hospitals. You know, that hospitals can't afford. Anyway, this was not mentioned in any of these programs. I talked about it three weeks ago. Well, I wasn't there. I, I know. I followed, well, I'm trying to keep it short, and I didn't keep okay, it short. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but no, you're you're right, and I agree with you. I would point out an install, Mr. Frank, an install for Epic is somewhere between 200 and about 300 million dollars. It's not cheap. Let me speak to that. You know, I agree with you 100% on everything. You heard the problems that we're having. Um, you know, trying to trying to deal with uh, CERN and contracts associated with CERN has been very very difficult for us to be able to change systems. However, we are working very hard to make that happen. We're actually working with the University of Vermont very closely, Kevin Irish, our CIO, and his team. That um, their team is very willing to allow us to piggyback onto them, and that is what our ultimate goal is. Um, and that is work that's being done behind the scenes, but we have to get out of this, this horrible situation we have in in order to make that happen. Sonny Eben, Dr. Eben over at UVM, um, he's all about critical access hospitals, hopping on to uh, through, uh, something called community, community connection. Uh, and that's what we're really working to do, because it's the only way we're going to have that level of communication. And although it may not be regional, I can tell you if you're on Epic and you go to Boston or you go to New York, you go to LA, chances are you're going to be, your record's going to pop right away. Uh, Mr. Mosley. Actually, I think I'll defer my comments. I'm sorry? I, have, I defer my comments. I'm not expected to be the first call, so I'll we'll watch the next person. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Page. Yes, sir. Um, this afternoon I, at our Rotary meeting, I talked about this afternoon at a, at a Rotary meeting, I talked about the final word. And I also uh, mentioned uh, to the audience that they were getting older too. 
And I encourage all of them to come here tonight. I see many of them here. My concern with getting older is the loss of some of these services at our hospital. And by the way, I'm very thankful that you and a lot of my colleagues uh, from the legislature and from the different agencies are here. But I do have some concerns about the loss of the urologist. I'm glad we have a new cardiologist, or a new old cardiologist is coming back. I'm disappointed about the hip replacement of a surgeon. I don't think that's necessary. Um, but anyways, I have some concerns of over these over these losses, and I'm also concerned about what other future losses there may be in some of these services as we get older. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. We share that concern. And I, as I've uh, talked with a number of boards and with the Green Mountain Board and others, I think there are options to at least keep um, some of those services nearby uh, and a number not to not the operational, the you know, hands-on knife sort of stuff, but for other things to make them more available at home and in, in some other ways. So, absolutely agree with you. Thank you, sir. And thanks for uh, other. Uh, let's see, we have uh, Mr. Labor. Thank you. Who knows why I'm not that? And for the yeah, we have Mark. And also the most rural. That's nine towns, three goals. To give you an example of dependencies, it's not a ship to the I went through the slide deck, it was forwarded in the email. Thank you very much for that. It was enlightening. And it does reflect the need for transformation in healthcare delivery systems. But decreasing our service level of providers to emergent care makes it very difficult to access specialists when needed. There is no good way from Newport, Vermont, from Cayman, Vermont, down to the University of Vermont Medical Center. Sometimes in the middle of winter, the old saying is you can't get there from here. And it's true. Versus our 15th hospital, which wasn't mentioned here. It's not just 14 in the state of Vermont. That's correct. Take a bridge and go across the river, and you go to the 15th hospital, and there was no mention made or measurement or data analysis presented that showed how many Vermont dollars and premium payments from Vermonters paid to the MSHA healthcare system. It's roughly 600 million. Thank you. <laughs> State and federal revenue streams have not kept up with the cost imposed on healthcare providers, be it special, be it primary care, or be it the institution. Hospital or clinic. They're way behind. You can't blame the cost of healthcare interest on the healthcare providers. The state has an only golden opportunity here, and the Green Mountain Care Board can help facilitate this. Take the 14 hospitals and have a GPL for all pharmaceuticals right across the board and eliminate PBMs. Thank you, they are working on, uh, they have a common chief that are looking at changing to one that will offer even more advantages. Well, the biggest purchaser of healthcare pharmaceuticals in the state is the state. Medicaid. That should be rectified. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, you know, I would note just that some of our recommendations are for state and federal change. Uh, as you're aware, the Senate and some other folks at the federal level are trying to address GPOs. But uh, sorry, uh, the wholesalers. Uh, but thank you. 
And you're right, that was one of the analyses that we tried to do was to bring patients back from out of state. Because just what you said, it's important before bringing Vermont dollars back to Vermont and uh, creating jobs. So thank you for your comments. Uh, so Ms. Peterson, or Patterson, I don't know. Thank you. I have, I have more of a of an ask rather than a suggestion or how we're going to solve the problem. Um, I would say that history has shown that our voice up here in the northern part of the Northeast Kingdom is a little bit often overshadowed by the louder and more populous populations such as Chittenden County. We know that in the legislature, we know that in programs. And I would ask that the board, the Green Mountain Care Board, understand and recognize that we are not just a beautiful view of the lake. We are living, breathing people living here, doing our best to back out a living, to, to sustain some reasonable quality of life. Our quality of life may be different than Chittenden County or along the southern border of Vermont, but it's some place that we choose to live. We tend, I think, I can't speak for everyone obviously, but I would think we tend to like a quieter lifestyle, things like that, but it does not mean that we want to live in pain, not have our medical needs met, and be considered just that place up in the Northeast Kingdom with the beautiful lake. So I would ask that you keep that in your forefront of your mind as you take in comments from the rest of the state and remember about this little group of gray hairs up here, that there's a few that aren't, but most of us. Um, but we all know we'll bend the curve when we all throw the old big down the cost of women out of care. Um, but anyway, um, so I would ask that this is a very heartfelt plea that you do not forget about us. That Sheffield Heights is a reality. That getting to Burlington is a reality. If you're, you know, dealing with people who can't drive, elderly people who don't want to make the drive to St. John's Fair, that's a reality. It's not like we're 20, we're all 23 year olds, so let's get in our car and sit down that way. So I think it's important to keep in mind. The other thing that I ask um, is the term affordability, affordability in healthcare. Now, I've been in the peripheral of healthcare since 1989. I'm not a professional, I don't pretend to be a doctor or a nurse. However, affordability, healthcare, affordable healthcare has been bandied around since 19, I think 1989, at least in my foggy memory. I have never, and maybe I have not looked in the correct places, but what exactly is affordable healthcare? When you look at the cost of salaries, which people deserve to earn, I'm not saying that people, doctors, nurses, you know, technicians don't deserve the salaries that they make. I'm glad they're there. Um, but the cost of the, the cost of um, equipment. I mean, when I sat on the board, it was easy because we had to upgrade to a, you know, 32 slice and you know machine from a 16 slice. Those costs are huge. How are you going to deal with that? So again, don't forget about us up here. We are living, breathing people, and I just ask that you not forget. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would, would only comment that the vast majority of folks who live in Vermont are rural. Now, not as rural as up here, but, but rural and do share the, the issues that you raise. Um, I, I would also say that there are newer technologies. For example, um, there is a movement toward use of more ultrasound than MRI and CTs for certain things. And so there, there are some ways, I think, with technology to reduce some of the costs. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, thank you again. Um, Representative Smith. I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I think this is working, isn't it? That glove? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not quite as eloquent a speaker as Representative Page is, but uh, I, I think that Melissa Patterson 
found my comments uh, somewhere written down and stolen from me because I, I couldn't agree with it more. So she, she hit the nail right on the head. And I believe that the Green Mountain Care Board probably should be working a little bit better with the North Country Hospital because there appears to be, uh, you know, it, it seems to me like there's a thumb pressing down and holding this hospital back. Uh, we've lost a couple of valuable uh, doctors and surgeons there. And uh, the Green Mountain Care Board needs to step up to the plate and help them a little bit more than they are. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Stamp, uh, the Stamp, sir. Stamp, sir. Kelsey Stamp. Yeah, that's me. Close. Hi, uh, my name is Kelsey Stamp. Can you hear me? No, no, no. 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 Can you hear me now? No. No. Oh, the off is on. Hello? No. Oh, no. Oh, far. Am I too far? Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Am I too far away? So I can, I, I think I can do it. No. Sorry. Thank you. So my name is Kelsey Southseth. I'm the Executive Director of Northeast Community Human Services, which is a designated agency um, that does mental health and substance use. And so first, I want to thank you for hosting the meeting and also uh, speak to the partnership and support of North Country Hospital. I think it is a core institution of our community, and I think they echo um, the sentiments of, like, don't forget about this area. I think we can get lost in economies of scale and efficiencies of um, organizations, and you lose the heart of it's an economic engine here. Sheffield Heights is real, asking people to travel, the ruralness the lack of internet, and so um, I was hoping you could speak a little bit more to um, the investment in the social determinants of health, and I'll speak to a quick anecdote about um, someone had a really high score on the PHQ-9, which is a depression scale. Oh, here. Here. <laughs> um, and so what do you prescribe for depression? Um, therapy, medications. Next time they come in, scores drop, you got a job. And so I'm wondering how the plan for healthcare reform also includes the external services, the determinants of health that way in, and how that fits into it. Because you know, I think this is a great entity, it's really focused on hospitals, but there's so much that plays into that. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how that will come together. Uh, and then the second part, I was hoping you could speak a little bit about the payers and how they're coming into that, because I agree with Tom about we are 90% Medicaid funded, and it's just hard to run a business on the payer rates and um, also where commercial insurers uh, in this process. So if you can speak to that, that'd be great. Great questions. Thank you very much. Um, I did not go into as much detail with social determinants of health as I would have liked. I, tried, I did try to keep comments short. I did mention, did talk fairly extensively about those three weeks ago. Uh, housing to me is the number one priority for the state. There you go. For a lot of reasons, you mentioned some. There's also a study I'm sure you're aware uh, from California that really suggested that one of the root causes of drug use was lack of home rather than the other way around. So for me, housing is number one because it really affects um, how people live, how they feel, how they behave, gives them stability, um, and it gives them a place to go that when they don't need care and that you could presumably provide care to them. The second one for me is transportation, right? And transportation for people, and I mentioned the little thing skipped over it. It's also transportation for patients between hospitals when they have to go and to get back from the hospital to the house or the nursing home or whatever. And that care is, or that transportation is, quote, not considered medically necessary. So it's not paid for. <coughs> which gets to your, your comments, which I, I agree with, about the payment levels for the feds and the state. 
the only thing I can say, and I did talk about this um, in, uh, in my comments yesterday, is the pressures on Medicare payments are enormous. And you've probably seen the, um, the Office of Medicare Actuaries projection that things are going to go really in a bad direction by 2035, I think now 2036. So there is a need for, and your congressional delegation and senators here have been very effective. Now, I have to say the folk from Massachusetts are leaning into that effort pretty aggressively, but um, it, it really needs more national attention. Medicaid, as you are aware, is a joint program to which the state contributes matching funds. Uh, those funds currently are provided by a tax on the hospitals. So for every dollar Mr. Frank and his team are able to earn, there's a, I forgot, 6% uh, tax that goes to the state so the state doesn't have to appropriate out of general revenue. So again, Medicare has been one of those programs at a national level um, that has received, uh, in my view, a lot of unwarranted attention because uh, some around the country view it as uh, something for people who don't want to work, and it's not. And in a similar way, they, they have uh, uh, issues with the women and the children who are being quick title to the team in the prior life on the Hill campaigning for that sort of thing. So, take your point. Um, I think the reality, though, is that those issues <laughs> if they are solved, are going to take the violence. Uh, I also agree with you about the internet. And I think you know, one of the things that we've talked about, Mr. Frank and I and the other folks in the hospitals have talked about, is as you're aware, the state does have a program to get internet, broadband internet out. Uh, that is starting more from the centers of towns and moving. And there are certainly a lot of areas in Vermont where, uh, you know, something as simple as a cell phone uh, won't work because there's no reception. Uh, so one of, the, one of the things that uh, I've mentioned to some others perhaps is whether the state could do some deal with Elon, with uh, Musk and his cloud of low-hanging satellites that are used in and designed to be used in Africa uh, that might help people that are really way, way up on those roads. And I, I can tell you, my parents retired to the mountaintop in Tennessee, nearest neighbor a mile away, nearest town of 518 miles down the gravel road. And those guys just got telephone uh, 10 years before my parents moved there in the mid 70s. So, uh, so, but Musk may have a way to deal with that. And I think it gets back to one of your earlier comments about are there things that either the state or the hospitals coming together and other people and, and using some money in different ways could do to help them. Right, and that's part of the planning process and one of the options informed by your experience and, and work and others that I think you have the opportunity to do because there is new technology. Right, I mentioned Amazon, you can, you know, monitor your blood pressure and, uh, you know, when I, when I trained as an intern in 71, the only way you got a blood oxygen is you put a needle in somebody's radio artery, drew it into a syringe with heparin, and sent it to the lab. And now it's on this. So I think there are ways that that currently are not uh, accessible to you, uh, but could be, and in other areas around the state. Thank you for those comments, and I. Uh, uh, we have worried about that and have made recommendations about it, and they will be. Uh, we're due to, to write a final report after all these meetings 
uh, for the Green Mountain Care Board and the Agency of Human Services. Uh, we'll have that finished by mid-August, and we'll, uh, and uh, you know, I'll circulate pieces of it. We've tried to be very interactive with the hospitals and the hospital association and others, and we'll circulate pieces of that around to get additional advice and help. Uh, let's see, we have uh, Representative Sims. Good evening. Um, thank you so much first for coming up here. You know, it really means a lot to have folks travel in person to your our community. And I think the large turnout tonight uh, tells you how important this issue is for our community. Um, I'm, I'm here as a representative, but I'm also here as a patient. Um, my family receives our primary care here in North Country. I had a son here at the hospital, and uh, I got my OB services here uh, with the other, and when the birth became more complicated, we were happy to be able to you know, access the network at UVM. And I, um, I, I think I, my reflections are similar to you know, themes you have already heard before. Um, certainly, you've outlined this, um, the challenges our whole healthcare system faces, and I think you, know, you all know our region faces additional unique challenges, sparse geography, um, demographic challenges, socioeconomic challenges, um, that make the care that's being provided here so critical. Um, I, I don't think anyone in this room would, would disagree with the goal of transforming the system so we can provide high quality care for everyone at a price we can afford. I, I think that sounds really good. Um, I think we need to stay focused on making sure that this community doesn't get left behind, that the cost savings don't come from eliminating, you know, the, at the expense of our community here, and I think that's something that too often this region has experienced in other issues. Um, you know, local access matters. Um, this is an equity issue. All Vermonters deserve access to the care they need at the time that they need it, and, you know, cutting services isn't going to help move people up that you know, accessing preventative care chain that um, is where the real savings are. I believe one of the earlier drafts you know, potentially recommended eliminating OB services, or this idea of outsourcing everything to telehealth by a for-profit private provider. Um, I, you know, I, I worry that that means limiting access. Folks will not seek the care that's further away, and they will end up with worse health outcomes that maybe in the short term help with some of the immediate short term margin challenges, but ultimately cost the system a lot more in the long run. Um, and so as this process continues to move forward, you know, the, the public hearings and the final drafts of the report, I, I hope we really stay focused on supporting the good care that's being provided here and really listening to the experts on the ground who are doing this work every day that I think have a lot of really great ideas. I'm so inspired and impressed by the collaboration that's happening between North Country and NBRH around hiring and training. I think there's a lot of efficiencies and savings to be found there. The new urgent uh, care facility right on, on Main Street here the front porch that's being opened to provide increased mental health services, the journey to recovery program and the vision to expand recovery services, even our community schools models where we're embedding more health care to kids in, in, in our community. There's a lot of great stuff going on here and I hope that we're um, building on those successes as we look to transform the system and you know in our small geographically dis dispersed state here I think many in the room would agree with me that um, you know one size uh, doesn't fit all here in Vermont. Um, or when we try a one size fit all model, usually our region gets left behind. Um, and then I hope we stay focused on innovative solutions that are really unique for each region um, and in that system. You know, we, we certainly face tremendous challenges in the healthcare space and really across a whole bunch of issues. You know. But, and then that can be daunting, but I, I really trust the wisdom that's in the room here and across the state. But really the wisdom that's here in this room, and I think if we all, you know, continue to collaborate more with our cities, we can, we can uh, transform the system in a way that provides better care and better care for it. So thank you for coming up here, and uh, we all continue to weigh in this conversation. Thank you. The ultimate decision about what happens in a community with health in a hospital is up to the board. Right? It's not Henry's decision. It's up to your hospital board and you. And so one of the things that I, you know, presented to the various hospitals was the future. 
what I thought was likely to happen, what a number of options were. We talked about those. And as I said yesterday to the, in my uh, presentation to the Green Mountain Care Board, at the end of the day, the options that the hospital said we don't want to do are not in the recommendations that we sent. But I will tell you that there are ways to deal with cardiology deserts, OB deserts, pharmacy deserts, and so forth. These are problems that are common across the country. There was a report yesterday uh, in the American Journal of Cardiology that 50% of counties in the U.S. do not have a cardiologist. The only white area in the state of Vermont is here that doesn't have a cardiologist. But I think the point is that there are ways to address those issues. Again, as a result of the involvement you all need to have, looking at additional things you can do with uh, St. John's Ferry and uh, Copley and, and others, uh, telehealth support, Epic, whatever it might be. Uh, I think there are options to preserve uh, very good health care in the community and to enhance it. And I, uh, I did drive over the pass on January 15th or 16th. There is ice in both <laughs> lanes of the interstate, both directions. Um, and I, when I went to Dartmouth and talked to their helicopter people, 30 and I know Tom and the group have a heated helipad out here. But the helicopter can't fly 30% of the time because it's either winter or there's fog somewhere. So those are issues, they are uh, more severe here, but not limited. And the health care for each community does need to be tailored to what the community needs. Okay. But, you know, I will go back and say that it takes a certain number of people who need a service to support, as you know, as Tom said, the, the salaries and the equipment and that. And so, for example, one of the things uh, which really helps get keep people out of the hospital is minimally invasive surgery. There's a machine for that, there's training for that, but it takes space. Right. And if you have an operating room that was built, let's say, before about 1985, the odds are that room's not big enough. And so the question is, do you expand it? Do you have enough general surgeons, obstetricians, and so forth that can use that equipment? And the team it takes to make it economically viable. And I think those are some of the decisions that you and your board and the folks at, at, in other areas need to come together and talk about because it has impacts not only on the care you give but also on the economics of things. So to, you know, to give you an example, um, I think I commented on yesterday, um, years back, if you had appendicitis, that was diagnosed from a light count and a physical exam the surgeon did. It was all over textbook. And if the surgeon did not have 50% of the appendices that they removed determined as normal, so half the patients he was operating on did not have appendicitis, he was considered to be bad because he wasn't uh, treating enough. Now, there's a handheld ultrasound that the guy in the emergency room uses, and he can tell whether the appendix is going to burst, and whether it's inflamed, and that kind of stuff. And the current treatment for that is the antibiotics. And 90% of people respond to antibiotics without surgery, about half of them sometime in the next year may relapse and then they need surgery. But you're getting people out of the emergency, almost out of the emergency room with IV antibiotics on home treatment. Whereas before, uh, you know, when they were doing 50% normals, the person was in the hospital a week. 
So, uh, you know, that <coughs> costs less. Of course, it also means the hospital is not as full. But those are the kind of things that have really changed a lot of this in the last 10 years. Right? That I think, you know, as you go forward with this process, you can learn about, discuss with your medical staff, who are very knowledgeable people, okay, about what meets your needs and how that can enhance the care you get <clears throat> as you get access to internet, for example, and the people who live within a certain area of town may already have that. So you have some options to perhaps treat those individuals a little differently while you're waiting on uh, Elon Musk's magic uh, satellites or whatever to get out into this. So, oh, sorry. Um, Mr. Cochran? Mr. Cochran, sorry. I work. Um, I work up at the uh, the ski resort, and um, we frequently we we use the hospital as a as a recruiting tool, right? Along with uh, after we explain that there is no housing for uh, new employees to come in, and the childcare is exorbitantly expensive, and the taxes are not getting conscious. We always can rely on the fact that the hospital is a uh, positive recruiting tool. It's something that I've used in the past. And I don't have a lot to say. There's been great comments here. I do want to follow up on what Melissa said. Because there is a process by which this community can be remembered. Um, and it's the part of that is the budget process as we go through uh, with Fremont Care. And you know the acknowledgement, which I'm, I'm sure that they acknowledge that we are truly uh, the only real critical uh, access uh, hospital in the state, the only one that checks off all the boxes, and we also happen to sit in the poorest corner of the state at the same time. So those two realities, I'm, I'm very hopeful, uh, are factored into the uh, remembering the community part of this process as we go forward with that with that budget process. Thank you. Uh, you point out very correctly that hospitals are part of and healthcare part of necessary infrastructure to, to get people to the community. Thank you. Uh, Mr. O'Carroll. Here. Here. Um, thank you very much, and I really appreciate uh, this meeting. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I am a new resident of the state of Vermont, came from Connecticut. They come here the last, what, three years? And fell in love with this hospital. I'm an emergency physician, by the way. That's, that's a little side thing. Um, that just wanted to know. Uh, and one of the reasons I fell in love with this place is that personalized care that this hospital gives. Um, I teach at a school medicine at Yale, and it happens that I am a teacher of a point of care ultrasound that you mentioned. And I've done it for a long period of time. I've been in emergency physician for 25 years. Um, and I came here, and I saw that one of the most important things that this hospital does, and not only the hospital, the primary do doctors that I've learned about, is that compassionate, personalized care. And that's what happened. If you read uh, Rosenberg's The Care of Strangers in the American, the Transformation of the American Healthcare System, that had changed with, has changed with technology. Things are going to be personal. It's not your doctor or like Dr. Bouchard's uncle who had a post you know, just you can't pay, just say thank you. That has changed. And, and the problem also is that, yeah, new technologies are more expensive. We're living longer, right? So we have to keep that we're still human beings and that we're living lives. New technologies. One of the reasons I'm here and with the new leadership, with Tom, with Nice, with Mark, and others, I teaching point of care ultrasound, I use ultrasound as a so I'd be taking it everywhere. I'd be taking it to Indonesia with my real team. I'd be taking it to uh, Argentina with it everywhere. But I tell them, the problem is not going to Argentina or Bali. It's also rural America. And rural America is not just North Vermont. It's North Connecticut. So I'm going to need help. The other thing is, I have a master in healthcare management. And I've been in the dark side. I've been to the CMO hospital, but I've also been to the CMO insurance company. Where the same thing you get to the dark side. 
But you know, the interesting thing is we have the same objectives. Health outcomes, because the burden of disease is going to increase our cost at the end. And for them, the loss ratio is, is horrible. So how can we partner with them to get us to help us? Not just hold the government, Medicare, Medicaid account. And also we have resources. We have resources like the ski resort. We have, there's a lot of friends of mine who come here because they love to ski. They love the, the lake. And I brought the Yale team not only here, the great audience where in the Yale game there's like 30 great audiences in the room. And there's not, not one here. I brought them here, they all fell in love with the place. And then I'm going to bring them back into the league, find that this is a place that they practice. And we have to acknowledge to do so. EMS, very important part, you mentioned the helicopter and stuff. We can improve that. And it's going to be cost effective. And again, if I get sick here, I want to go to our country. I want Dr. Holland to do the healing, do the point of care, which is not Who said he's not a lawyer, and now he's an expert. So things, we can do things. But the most important thing is the community, every single one of you, is accountable for the success of our healthcare system. It's not the government, it's, not, it's us. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Other comments, questions? If you are not, we said the night was still playing here. Good. I'm sure you walk and better than us. I have no significant disagreement. You want to call this one? I said, you know, this is the, the quality of the work of the parent. <clears throat> I do, um, uh, we disagree a little bit on emphasis. And the emphasis, first of all, uh, thank you. Do you hear that? Yeah. Um, uh, the, this is a system, right? This is a health system. In order to have a, a system. Put it in your mouth. <laughs> Put it in your mouth. A system is multiple moving pieces, and for it to work in an integrated fashion, it needs leadership. Okay. And Tom Franks can't, he can provide leadership here, but he can't do this. And so the, the one dramatic thing about this plan that we saw in the plan, they in fact identified the leader. And that is the agency of human source. So that's the first step. And so there's now there's a leader. The point that I would 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 put a little different emphasis on is information. Okay. To take care of the patients, you need good information. Take care of a hospital, you need good information. To take care of the whole system, you need good information. And what has happened? What, and, and it's, it's interesting that here in uh, Newport, Tom Franks put his finger right on it. Although, I, again, I would explain it a little differently. You know, he says, you know, we've lost millions of dollars because of this information system. And so, how did that happen? How did this community, how did the entire country get these information, information systems uh, hoisted on them, forced on them, uh, which impair patient care, cause physician burnout, uh, lead to significant uh, errors in healthcare, causing death? How did that happen? Does anybody know? Uh, well, here's my explanation. Uh, first of all, you have to go back to 1954. Uh, and in 1954, no, it wasn't 54, it was 60. 1960. And our then president, Dwight Eisenhower, who you, you have to acknowledge as a man of integrity, a man of experience. Okay. You can't you can't doubt what he said. And he said basically said, hey, I've been in this business for a long time, getting, getting ready to get out of it. And these guys need to be aware of the military industrial complex because they control what happens to the same 
everything. And he said, it's interesting, he said, the only thing that will prevent the adverse effects of that is alert and knowledgeable citizens. So we have a definition of problems and we have a solution. 1991, Arnold Wellman, esteemed editor of the New York Times, said, published an article, and he says, guess what, folks? There's a new industrial complex. And it is the health industrial complex, and they are going to control health policy. Okay. Okay. Fast forward to 2008, we have this great economic meltdown of the country. Okay. And they passed this Economic Recovery Act. And how much money did the government give to uh, the big corporations that make information systems? $30 billion. And then they, re uh, they required that we use those information systems. They ran out in like 2015. They required to use it. In order, to, in order to take care of patients, in order to get paid by Medicare, you had to have one of these systems and you had to use it. They never tested the system. Okay? And so that's how it happened. And so it was a big uproar at the time. There were articles in the New England Journal of Medicine, and uh, the New York has got a great article about, about uh, the adverse effect of these systems. And uh, so uh, the American Medical Association, I'm not particularly a great uh, fan of them, but uh, they commissioned a study with the Rand Corporation. And the Rand Corporation said, these are a premature technology that has been forced on the healthcare system. So that's, that's, the, that's a major player in all the stuff that's going on here. Is that these information systems will take care of patient care, will be required to use and cause patient care. So now, so here's the point that I want to make, where it's maybe a little different emphasis. Right, and uh, let me let me just before I get off to side back, here's I had a specific recommendation. Okay, the, the chair, you the chair, correct? Chair of the care board? Yes. Yes. And this gentleman you know, knows a little bit about uh, information systems. My recommendation is this, that the um, <clears throat> Green Mountain Care Board, or the AHS, uh, convene a study commission to look at all the actual operational requirements you need for a good clinical information system, for a good information system that will help uh, hospital administrators and health administrators administer the system for a state to manage it. Okay, sit down and make a list of those requirements. Okay, and have some information people there too. Now, so, so uh, okay, and then you don't have to necessarily build this, but simply specifying what it takes is going to change the whole thing because. Uh, people will begin to understand that this is a system, and you can't you can't re rely upon capitalism on on industry because they're out to make a profit, right? So they find a little niche where they can do something and make a profit. So what what happened with the with the health information systems? They took medical records the way they were and they computerized them. Okay. And there's so much more capability that you can do with the computer than what these things do. And so that's my recommendation is specify what we need to do this right. Okay? So write it down and you'll have a conversation and some great things will happen because you that's the problem. Okay. And it doesn't have to be 10 information systems, it can be one, and you can make it free for everybody, and you've got a different world. Thank you very much. Uh, the information and transmission accurately and timely is absolutely sound. Uh, and I have commented, we'll get to you in a second, I have commented on that several times. 
Uh, that's a very good suggestion. I'm told the uh, vital, I talked to the lady who runs vital, and she said she was convening a group of providers to get input, but I think you may have a better idea. Um, let's see. Uh, we have a gentleman back there first, I think, and then the lady who, sorry. All right, thank you. Uh, Bruce, Sean Tassler, Northeast yes, Regional right. Hospital. Good to see you tonight. And I realize that I'm one of the people standing between you and jumping in the lake right now. <laughs> I just want to, um, I grew up with a foot in two worlds. My, uh, I was raised by my mother in Lindenville, but my father, I spent my weekends in Barton on his Christmas tree farm. So I very much understand these communities. And they are part of my, part of my upbringing here. And they're very near and dear to my heart. I think uh, one thing that my grandfather taught me growing up was that when the Baylor breaks and there's storm clouds on the horizon, you gotta do what you have to do to get the hay in. And when that happens, your neighbors and your friends show up to help. And I think that's one of the things that Tom and I have been talking about, our teams have been exploring together, is how do we work together to solve these problems? One thing I'm really excited about to see in this room today is the engagement from the community, from our legislators, and the state, all coming together to help us solve these problems. Because working together, together as a team to meet the needs of the entire Northeast Kingdom, Orleans County, Caledonia County, most importantly, Essex County, I think we can come up with a system that's more resilient and meets all our needs, because we know deeply in our hearts exactly what we need to serve all of you. Thank you. My name is Laurie Brown. I've lived in Newport for 18 years, and I've been involved in a lot of community conversations about a lot of things in our area. And much of what has been said tonight is on the forefront today, the housing, uh, transportation. To transportation, we have rural community transport, RCT, but it is inaccessible to people who do not have Medicaid or Medicare. Uh, my mother-in-law lived with us until she passed away, and I could not get transportation from them from my house to the center of town for less than $25 a trip, and that was 10 years ago. It's just unacceptable. We've got to do better. So I think that hopefully that will come into the conversation. The other thing I want to say is to Mr. Frank and um, to other people here who are in this process, um, because I used to be, a, I was a um, North Country Hospital employee. I will go to the death to anyone who speaks poorly about this hospital. Um, but don't forget the people in this room. Don't forget this conversation. Because many times for those of us who are citizens living here, working here, these conversations in a month or two will just be forgotten. And, and the community, you know, the board will sit down, you guys will sit down, and you'll forget that what Ms. Pettison said was absolutely truth of what's going on here. Don't forget the things that have been said here tonight. Thank you. Other questions, comments, sir? Hi, so I'm uh, Justin Barton Kaplan. I uh, work at the health department. Uh, I also met the president of RCT and our local FQHC, so I got a lot to say, but I'll try and keep it fast. Um, and exciting things coming. We just have a new transit plan that's going to address some of the things that you just talked about. But uh, so, first, I want to say that North Country Hospital is just an amazing partner. Um, they go above and beyond. We have like, some of the most vulnerable populations in the state. Um, you know, they work tirelessly to get Veggie Van Gogh to come up here. I believe, I'm, I could be wrong, but I think we still hold the record for the largest number of yes, food distributions to over 500 households. Uh, so, oh, six, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so just tremendous partners that are really on the ground, you know, really trying to meet the needs of our community. And so I just want to share kudos, because uh, they are great partners. Um, I'm excited to see a lot of things that you talked about. One of the things, though, that I'm a little concerned about, because I want to go back to social determinants of health, um, particularly since those are going to be drivers of healthcare reform. Uh, you know, you guys just got awarded the eight, uh, head model. Uh, CMS, you know, is really going to be reimbursing based on health status, um, social determinants of health, and how you're addressing those. Uh, and so I think it's great that you're partnering with AHS. But a lot of those 
drivers, we know that a majority of health is driven by socioeconomics. This region has the lowest, some of the lowest health statuses in the state, and we know it's related to economics. And so I, I really think that you guys need to be thinking at a cabinet level in terms of how we're gonna have transformable, uh, transformative healthcare, because the things that are driving people's health are bigger than AHS. And we need investment, we need economic development, we need ACCD at the table, we need our regional planning partners. So you know, I, I think you guys are doing a great job, but you need to be thinking bigger. And I think uh, you know we're doing a pilot right now where we're doing a coordinated community health needs assessment across the kingdom involving multiple agencies, not just the hospitals. And the idea is that we want to use that to identify priorities and use collective impact. There's also discussion of maybe partnering with the health department so that we're doing this in a synchronous way with their state health assessment. I think you guys should be thinking about having a statewide health assessment with a coordinated community health needs assessment so you guys can do a very similar process, identify statewide priorities, have the hospitals identify their local priorities, and then also create funding streams that help them achieve what they've identified in their community health needs assessment. Community benefit dollars are limited, you know, especially when you have a high Medicaid population, like there are just not enough resources to, to make a, you know, a huge change in those uh, indicators if there are not funding streams. And you know, all of that state funding that comes is tied to federal deliverables typically. So to really be thinking about transformative change by helping hospitals make the changes that are driving health locally. That's my soapbox, I'll stop there. But I do also want to share a story um, about dialysis because as the president of RCT, I've heard so many stories about fragile, uh, people with fragile medical conditions who are driving two to three hours one way to receive dialysis services. And there have been numerous EMS calls that have had to be made mid-transport. That is unacceptable. We need to be thinking about how we get capacity here the, you know, I think there were some reductions in capacity in St. J, and now there's reductions in Lancaster, which is the overflow. People cannot be on buses going to dialysis halfway across the state or all the way at the bottom of the state. So you guys need to be really looking at that. And my last thing is, you know, as you guys think about your EMS system, think about the investment in the kingdom. When they got rid of the local dispatch, that was like 15 to 20 jobs that moved out of the kingdom, went to Williston, they couldn't recruit people because it's a tight job market, yet that is money leaving the kingdom, and we have huge economic issues. So be thinking about that as you're thinking about regional centers. You need to be really thinking about areas that need investment. Thank you, and I'll shut up now. <laughs> We are aware of the dialysis issues. I'm glad North, North Country has a dialysis, small dialysis center. But one of the other issues that's related to that is that a lot of folks, uh, UVM I think told us 640 roughly a year or two ago, were transferred from community hospitals where they could have been treated for pneumonia, whatever it was, and yet their own dialysis had a complication. They were sent to UVM or Gardner. And so one of the one of the conversations that I've already had uh, with the Green Mountain Care Board folk and some of the other hospitals is to say, look, you don't need a CON to get a couple of dialysis machines. And there are some hospitals, like or there's one other, is like North Country that has an ambulatory dialysis unit in the hospital, down the hall from the ICU, and, and you can keep those people here. And you know, I think the other thing we've talked about, but again, it gets to housing. And do you have stable electricity? Do you have good water? Uh, do you have a safe place to live? Is home dialysis. Right, and that's been going on since uh, at least 1976. So one of the other suggestions to the UVM people who run all the, I think the one at, uh, in uh, St. Johnsbury at Northeast, uh, is to train patients and their families to do that. Because staffing is a big issue, and if I remember correctly, Sean told me that the unit in uh, St. John's had to limit hours because they didn't have staff. So 
Thank you for your comments on Target. Right now. Sorry. When, I, when I see the um, statistics on population, I think about what you've said about increases in the capacity of medical science. For instance, the appendix figures. And I wonder whether in looking at those over the next 25 years or so, whether you're taking into account what the actual capacity or what you need to be older will be, as opposed to say today, certainly 20 years ago, um, the number of people who were working, you were doing it, seemed to be kind of a slow. Um, well, you know, it doesn't have to decline, nor do people who are older necessarily have to present the same level of care need as they do today. Is that something that you take into account in your planning? Short answer is yes. Um, I think that is a, will be a big focus of, of the efforts going forward. I mean, the example I use is, um, you know, there was a group that reported the Women's Journal uh, within the last few weeks that they had literally a pill that would prolong the life of a fairly lengthy, uh, you know, 18 months or something, to treat brain cancer rather than radiation and all that. So I think there are developments that are underway. It's hard to tell exactly what those are. Right? But certainly, I think there's hope out there for some of this. And for, uh, you know, for example, prostatic enlargement. Common in um, used to require a surgery. Now there's a pill. And very effective. So, so yes, I, I think there are ways that that can be addressed. And agree with the point about you know economic development a little beyond what I've been asked to do in the early forties. But I think at the end of the day, the key the, you know a real need is for the community to come together in this process. The uh, agency of human services is going to lead so that you can plan for something. So I think we're. <laughs> if we could take a couple more questions and then I'll just. Just noting the time, um, I think Bruce is available. If you still want to talk to him and ask him questions, is that okay? Um, we might start breaking down for this I think that Todd, Felix wants to say one I, I actually jumped in over 10 this morning, so I'm still fairly cool. But, um, I just want to say, as part of this process and, and AHS um, leading that work in collaboration with the CARE Board, that a, a big piece of it um, is recognizing that what, what Bruce and his team are putting together is a series of recommendations, right? And that is something that we are looking at in concert with the feedback we get from communities. And that will begin the real planning and work process of transformation. We recognize the urgency, but we also recognize the deep importance of the work for every community. And it's great to start here in Newport. I just again want to state my deep appreciation for folks being here um, and taking a real sincere and deep interest. I think what Sean Tester said earlier, um, Representative Sims and, and other folks have said, Justin as well, um, really valuable input. And I just thank you all for sticking it out and uh, see you again soon.